And we're back in Inside the Ropes, and it's another edition of Where Are They Now? And in the late 1990s, WCW became the number one company in the world. And our guest tonight is someone who was not only on screen, but someone who had a hand in some of the talent that was part of that spectacular period in pro wrestling. He is manager extraordinaire, Sonny Ono. Sonny, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Love your country. And, and been there once, and uh, the history that you have, and what a great country. Thank you very much. And um, so, so, yeah, I mean, I guess we should kind of go right back to the beginning with you of um, you kind of became involved with pro wrestling through a relationship that you cultivated with Eric Bischoff in the 1970s. Can you tell us a little bit about how you met him? And- yeah, both of us, both of us were, uh, uh, um, you know, we were, we were enjoying our uh, uh, martial arts. That we were both involved in karate. He was up in Minneapolis, teaching up in Bloomington, Minnesota. I was down here in Iowa. Uh, we would, uh, as a young man, we would travel to a karate tournament all over the United States, so that uh, we can we can pay a, a twenty-five dollar fee and. And, and get to beat up people on the weekends and, and uh, <laughs> uh, drink a lot of uh, uh, ale, as you say in your country, and, and uh, be, able to, be able to come home and not, not get arrested. And <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, there was a group of us who was traveling, and one of the guys was Eric, and we got to be a good friends, and we'd done some business prior to uh, uh, WCW. We, we'd done some business together, so uh, we knew each other quite well. Uh, one day, I got a phone call from Eric after he'd been involved with, uh, he was with AWA for a while up in Minneapolis, and then, then he got hired down uh, in Atlanta uh, by uh, a Ted Turner company, WCW, and then um, he asked me to go to Japan and, uh, and repair some of the damage that was done over there with New Japan Pro Wrestling. And so I went along for the ride and um, didn't know anything about the business, kind of jumped in with my, you know, both feet. And uh, try to try to uh, uh, repair some of the damage that was done by a prior management. And when you when you, you like you said, you know, you had come into the wrestling business not really, you know, being that familiar with it. Um, how did you enjoy that role? And obviously, eventually, that would turn into you having an on screen um, an on screen character. But the the time period where you got there is a very interesting period because WCW and I guess Eric Bischoff. This was around the time where he signed Hulk Hogan and he sort of made a lot of changes uh, to WCW that would ultimately allow them to, to become number one. What are your memories of that sort of whirlwind time period? Well, you know, about the same time we were bringing a New, new Japan talent, we were, you know, we were, uh, uh, we were down in Disney and I was with Eric trying to get uh, Hulk to come on board with us. And, and that was a big, big deal, you know, bringing, bringing Hulk Hogan to WCW. Um, at that time, um, um, Hulk was uh, uh, taping a television show down in Orlando, and we were down in Orlando. Um, so, uh, you know, I remember meeting, along with Eric, you know, meeting Hulk, and, and, and lucky for us, you know, he came on board. And, and uh, I think Eric did a lot of things that, that he didn't, you know, people talk about, you know, negative part of Eric, but you got to remember what Eric Bischoff did. You know, he, he, he brought WCW to the point where the talent, all, every talent, uh, because, of, because of the competitive nature of WWF at the time and WCW, Eric was getting a new talent over uh, from Japan and, and from WWE. That allowed a lot of talent to make a lot of money. I think it's, it's unprecedented what kind of money those guys made during that period. So, you know, you, you, you cannot like, you know, a lot of people can be negative about Eric. But I think people can't forget, especially a talent, um, all the talents that was there can't forget what that man did directly, directly or indirectly for them to, to be able to, you know, increase, increase their value and, and, and their income. And um, what, led, what led to you then becoming an on-screen character and how did you feel about that when you were approached about it? Oh, well, oh, no, well you know, I, I, um, um, I have been... Um, because of my martial art thing, I, you know, I, I done some on camera stuff before. Um, you know, we, we did some back in the days. We did some martial arts movies and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I have some experience, but certainly not a live experience like being a manager. But, but what was really great at the time was when I when I got those opportunity, people like Jimmy Hart and and you know other great managers that was with 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 the company, you know, certainly helped us or helped me. You know, to, and 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 guys like Masa. Saito, and you know they helped me 
you know, create that character. And, and, and honestly, it's a fun, you know, it's a great time. I knew I was riding a great, you know, great wave if you can say, if you're a surfer. And I think, you know, retrospect, you can, anybody can tell you that was the best time of, uh, uh, as a pro wrestling, or history of pro wrestling, one of the best time ever, you know, late 90s. And, uh, and around this time as well, I guess maybe one of the most successful guys that you managed um, in WCW and that you're most fondly associated with is Ultimo Dragon. Um, what was your relationship like with him? Because I think you must, I think you knew him before that point in time. And how do you, how do you remember that run with him, with the, you know, the cruiserweight title with Malenko and all that sort of stuff? Yeah. Well, Ultimo Dragon was, you know, he was already working with the, uh, uh, the, the Malenkos and, and Benoit and, and and Guerreros, Jericho at the time uh, when they came over. Um, so, uh, Ultimate Dragon was actually uh, uh, Mr. Inoki, who was the president of uh, New Japan at the time, was uh, doing an event in L.A. Eric and I and, and a couple other people flew out to L.A. to meet with Mr. Inoki, and uh, that's uh, we. I think that I believe that's the first time we've seen Ultimate Dragon. And then you know Eric was really impressed by Ultimate Dragon and of course his his history because he was really a you know really a first of the hybrid if you can use that word, of Japanese wrestling that was, you know, for, for those fans who don't know, Japanese wrestling, pro wrestling, is much more stiffer than you'll, you'll probably see. I think most of you will agree with that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then you got lucha style, high-flying, uh, not very stiff, a lot more acro- acrobatic stuff. And I think, you know, he, you know, fused those things together and he became one of the great cruiserweights because he. You got to remember, you know, Ultimo Dragon is the only person to ha- hold WWF and WCW belt, along with New Japan, and he was the one person to hold up the ten belts at the time. You know, that nobody has ever done it, and nobody will ever do it again. Before Rey Mysterio, there was Ultimo Dragon. And you know, back in uh, late 1995, when when Nitro launched, and it was live every Monday, and you know, there's um, there's 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 different sort of trains of thought. Some ex WCW guys say that it, the WCW Nitro uh, tapings weren't very organised, and you wouldn't know what you were doing to the last minute. But then other guys say that wasn't the case. What was your experience like? Was it when you went to TV? Was it was it a sort of organised environment, or was it a kind of shark eat shark? You know, ten minutes before you go out, you get handed what you're going to do. What was it like? You know, you got to understand, I mean, people can complain all they want, but end of the day, we're getting paid, whether we sat there or we were performed. Trust me, it wasn't like digging ditches. We all want to be on television to advance I think, ourselves as, as, as a talent and get some airtime. But other than that, um, I, th- I think there was a last-minute changes, but you got to remember, it's a live television. You know, mm-hmm. live television, you're going to you're gonna get last-minute changes. Um, and depend whether talent gets hurt or, you know, uh, storyline gets changed or, you know, I, mean, we, I was not involved in, in booking at the, in, at the highest level. So, you know, there, there, was, there was the changes that have to be made. But I think, I think as a product that we put out there um, and, and the performance of the wrestler was, was um, you know, just as good as anybody else or better. And when, when the NWO angle kicked off in the summer of 1996, um, it, did it feel like something was really changing, and that this was going to be one of the things that were going to propel WCW? Well, I think you know when, when they launched the Nitro, and and we went to head to head with uh, there was a segment, if you remember, of of Chono. Um, uh, I, br- I was I was managing Chono, one of the top wrestler today, even uh, from mm-hmm. New Japan. He double crossed me and joined an NWO. Yeah, and then then I brought Great Muda over the biggest Japanese uh, a superstar at the time, um, and still is, I bring him over to avenge my my uh, my honor, and he double-crossed me and joins NWO. So at, <laughs> at that point, they created what they called NWO Japan. And, and I don't know how many people, unless if you're smart about Japanese wrestling history, and, and certainly during that period, NWO Japan was so big in Japan, it, was, it, it propelled New Japan to the height, just like he did with us here um, in the United States. And, and, and to give you an idea, uh, one summer, I believe it was in 1998, 
they sold over five million dollars worth of t shirt. Just a plain black NWL t shirt and, and, and a series of one summer. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. I I also wanted to ask you, you know, you, you met we we talked a little bit earlier on about Nitro and sort of that live T V aspect. And I just wondered, looking back, there were so many sort of shocking moments that happened over the years. What do you, you know, looking back now, what do you remember? Was there any moment that happened, whether it was somebody turning up that nobody knew about or something that happened? Is there anything that really shocked you when you were, like, at one of the shows? And Did you know beforehand that Lex Luger was going to turn up on the first Nitro? Or was, you know, if you were friends with Eric, did he let you in on that? Or did nobody no, know no, about I, that? No, I think a lot of those things, so they, they, they kept it quiet pretty well. You know, Kevin Nash showed up and, and when NWO stuff started and I, I, I knew I knew uh, uh, I, I knew about Medusa when, when she came over. And but I think one of the shocking moments probably in, 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 in wrestling is when she dropped that women WWF belt into the into the garbage can. I think we were, you know, they're always looking for. Remember, we were live all the time. So those are the things that you go. Wow, she really did that, <laughs> you know. So. <laughs> and then you mentioned as well that you would go on to then manage Ernest Miller later on. I guess that's the first, um, the first kind of native English-speaking guy that you had. Yeah. So was that? What, what was it? Was there a difference there? Was it? Was it more relaxing for you at that point because you could kind of just kind of kick back and have a bit of fun with it? Well, or yeah, you, you no- got to remember. And I, I don't think a lot of you know. I, I mean, the fan understood it more than more than uh, I think a lot of the guys is that you got to remember. I was a I was in essence a mouthpiece, an irritating rich Japanese guy that was boasting about Japan all the time. That was my character that I came in with, and then then I be you know when I was with Ernest, uh, that's that wasn't the guy. I was I was you know I'm, last person Ernest Miller needs a mouthpiece. So, but because of our karate background, we you know I was and 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 we knew each other from the karate days as well. So you know I was more of a sidekick. I was the reason why Ernest would lose. Or you know, I, I will make a mistake, and you know, and 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 so I was more of a silent sidekick. I really didn't speak much at all. Um, you hear stories sometimes of the back uh, backstage. There was cliques, and some of the top guys might have politicked um, backstage. Did you ever see any of that? Like, was was the atmosphere good uh, backstage at Nitro? Or, or, or Thunder or wherever you were, was it a good atmosphere backstage to be around and were, were all the top guys friendly with people? I really don't know how the top guy like Hulk and Nash and, and, and you know, those guys and, and, and top guys, you know, you, you, you had few people that were disgruntled for one reason or another. Um, but I will tell you, as an individual, um, you, you got somebody like Macho Man Randy Savage, um, you would think, you would think that guy would be, you know, he was a superstar. He's, he's, he's unapproachable. I know he had, you know, a little, they had a little heat between Hawk and them, but, you know, they're so professional when they work. And in and, and my experience with Macho Man, he's so kind. He was up, we, we did a show up in Minneapolis, and, um, and uh, uh, he came down, drove 100 miles with me to, to the town in Iowa, um, and he actually showed up on my daughter's um, and show and tell in, in her grade school. I mean, you know, you, you you know, you bring you bring show and tell from home, but you know, my daughter brought Macho Man Randy Savage to school. <laughs> you know, and for him to do that, you know, and and he says, yeah, let's go down and do that. You know, I mean, he just he just kind of, you know, I, I will be forever grateful for for. Um, guy like him who's who's absolute superstar and 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 taking time to do that for me and my girl and and uh, so you know and 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 i uh um you know i mean i can tell you story after story of 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 um those guys were always very generous um you know bobby the brain heenan was always trying to help me was man man you know stuff i didn't know any you know, about wrestling uh, uh, mean Gene Oakland was a, uh, the best at you know helping me with with uh, doing interviews. Um, you know all those guys are very very generous when it comes to that, and they were all about you know putting out a best product. So I, I think I think you know personal position and jealousy gets overplayed a little bit. You know 
Um, everybody mm-hmm. want to hear that they think it was really negative. But end of the day, like I said earlier at the beginning of the show, that you know it was the best time of pro, pro wrestling um, um, for the talent and, and and for the fans, and and certainly for the talent who who got the made you know make more made more money than any time in their career. And I, I also kind of wondered back back in 1999. Obviously, Eric kind of parted ways with WCW for a while, and they brought in Vince Russo. Um, to head up the kind of creative team, and then shortly thereafter, you ended up leaving the company. Um, just for people who haven't really heard of what happened, what what are, what what kind of happened there in that time period? What led to you leaving the company? Well, you know, I, I have just signed a two-year contract with the company prior to that, um, and and uh, Russo came in, and uh, he, I, you know, he made a statement on 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 a, um, I think it was in, on a WCW internet. Live, live site on a WCW internet radio show, whatever it was, that he was from America and he he didn't want anybody. He he wanted to have a, he wanted to see nothing but American on television. And right after that, he wasn't just he wasn't just a Japanese or myself, although um, um, I'm probably more American than he is. Um, but anyway, <laughs> he uh, he he just took all of us off TV, and um, and I said, well, you know what, you can't do that publicly <laughs> you, you can't you, you can't categorize and say um, um, you don't want certain races on my television show <laughs> so he so he had went on he had went on this WCW live show and said explicitly that he just wanted it. I, I, I do vaguely remember hearing something about that so he had said that he, that he didn't want any international stars on the show anymore. He said he didn't want any Japanese or, or Mexican on his television show. He was from America and he, was, he wanted to see American on his show. That's what he said. And then did you, when you were taken off the shows, did you decide to leave or did they let you go? Or? No, um, they, uh, I, I, you know, like I said, I just signed my two-year deal. So uh, mm-hmm. and then, uh, um, then they asked me, you know, then they exercised their terminate, termi- termination as part of their contract. So, but the way, way they went about it, you know, so, so that that's basically what happened. On a brighter note, yeah. <laughs> um, one of we had sort of put up on our Facebook page that you were coming on the show, and we had sort of various comments, people quite excited about it. And uh, one of our listeners, I just thought I'd read out this comment to you. Um, this is on Facebook, so I presume this is not his real name, but D Rock Magrum. Uh, says that you were the first guy that he met in the wrestling business. He was 12 years old and. Um, you, you, you walked through the crowd. Uh, he asked for a photo, and you grabbed his camera and took a picture of you and him, just like you used to do when you came out in WCW. And he says you're a super cool guy, and he wants to thank you for it. Oh well, thank you. Well, you know, I, th- I think I think people have a tendency to forget. Certainly, we were we were, you know, we were never promoted as a big big time superstar. But you know, we were on television. Uh, matter of fact, uh, uh, you got to remember prior to me disappearing on television. I mean, there was no storyline how I disappeared. I just disappeared one day, and, you know, so, so along with all the Mexicans and Japanese. One of the things that, that, that the people forget is that, um, you know, the fan that makes us, you know, so you always, we all, you always have fan, time for fans. Uh, Sonny, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show, and um, we, we hope you have a great day. All right. Thanks, thanks for having me. Goodbye.